that's exciting, right? <laughs> um, and so we are uh, doing this in a hybrid mode. So for people who are on Zoom, um, Darko, I think, is managing uh, that setup. So as we go through, um, well, if you're on Zoom, I'd ask that you have your um, uh, keep yourself uh, muted. Um, but if you do have a question, you can put your name in the chat. And I think Darko is going to call on people during the QA period from the Zoom uh, for that. Um, for all of us, I, again, in, in addition to welcome you here, I want to acknowledge that um, this colloquium and all the work we do here uh, takes place on the unceded ancestral and uh, uh, traditional territory of the Musqueam people, and we acknowledge that. And again, it's great to be here in person. And it's really great to have um, Steph Freiberg here. Uh, so Steph and I go back to um, the University of Arizona. So she did her PhD at Stanford University and joined the faculty at the University of Arizona in Tucson, uh, where I was on the faculty at the time, and we had dinner last night, and we're talking about how I was kind of close to tenure, I had just gotten tenure, I think, when you come, as well as some other junior faculty, and I was very happy to be kind of adopted by the junior <laughs> faculty who treated me like I was still untenured, which was, you know, it was nice <laughs> to, to have that social network. Um, um, but uh, Steph is also a member of the Tulalip tribes, sort of down the road across the, uh, across the border in, uh, in Washington. And so she's been there during the pandemic um, with her family. And so it was also an opportunity for Steph to drive up um, with some hassle at the border yesterday, <laughs> um, but to come uh, and be with us before she sort of goes back to University of Michigan, where she is now. Now, in between... Um, uh, joining Michigan, where she is, I have the title here, the University Diversity and Social Transformation Professor in the Department of Psychology. Uh, she had a stint at the University of Washington um, uh, in between, uh, but Michigan wooed her away in 2019, I think, yep. 2018, something like that. Um, Steph's primary research interests focused on how social representation of race, race culture, and social class um, influence the development of self and psychological well-being. Um, she's probably best known, though, for the work that she's done to understand the social psychological experience of Native Americans and other indigenous populations. I mean, really, she is the leading expert on um, the social psychology and cultural aspects of Native American experience on this continent and probably you know, uh, on the world scene as well. Um, uh, for example, uh, her work has documented the psychological costs of Indian sports, ma sports mascots, making her an influential figure in elevating the conversation that's led to um, dozens of teams, you probably know the exact number, um, to change mascots um, in the past decade. Um, so when I think of like, you know, school desegregation and like Ken and Mamie's like doll studies and how important that was for like elevating a conversation and being kind of key evidence to sort of change policy. I think of Steph's research as having a similar effect on that conversation about, um, about mascots and more generally about representation and the importance of representation for people who have long been left out of the conversation. Um, Steph's work's not just impactful in that policy way, although certainly that's one of the things that I really think is, uh, is, is the hallmark of the kind of work that she does, um, but it's also very impactful in the, in the literature as well. Um, she's published over four dozen articles that have appeared um, in uh, high impact journals like PNAS and uh, Trends in Cognitive Science, JPSB, Psych Inquiry, um, developmental work too in developmental psychology and child development. Um, she's received continuous funding over the past four decades or over the past decade with a range of um, sources. So from things like NS obviously, and um, the Gates Foundation. She recently uh, got a $5 million grant from the Andrew Mellon um, Foundation. She's recruiting postdocs for any of you who are interested <laughs> in jobs. Um, she has a long list of both um, leadership roles and awards. She was recently, I think recently cycled off as the president um, for the Society of the Psychological Study of Social Issues, where she's done a lot of other executive leadership work. Um, she was the winner of the Distinguished Service 
Service Award um, to the field for SBSB, the Otto Kleinberg Intercultural and International Relations Award, the Louise Kidder Early Career Award, and at Arizona, where I was, also um, the U of A Five Star Faculty Award. She is an amazing um, uh, lecturer, undergraduate teacher too, and she's been awarded. She's been acknowledged for that, in addition to her her research and scholarship and service. Um, and so today, she's going to talk about um, omission as the modern form of bias against Indigenous people. And so, I want you to give her a warm welcome. Thanks, Tony. So I'm not going to lie. Does it work now? Yes. Good. Okay. All right. So I want to start today um, first by thanking you for having me here. Um, it's not my first time coming to UBC to give a talk, um, but I always enjoy coming here. And there is a deeper piece to this for me. So the Musqueam people are actually part of our people. So for the Coast Salish people, we extend into Canada. Um, you know, one of the last times I was here, I had the opportunity to meet with people from the Musqueam tribe. Um, and there was a real sense, like when I walk around, I can see the language, similar, I mean, it's the same language. Um, and so there's something very nice. I got out, I hiked this morning, I did the Salish Trail, um, and just kind of took some time to enjoy being in this space. And, and when I am in these kinds of spaces, I try to think about my ancestors who, who were in this space and what it was like for them. And so I'm, I'm delighted to be back. I'm um, really excited to be in person. I'm so tired of doing colloquiums online. Um, you feel like you're talking to yourself. And um, turns out I really get energy from being around people, not so much energy from watching myself give a talk. So, um, you know, I want to take a moment to mention RISE. Um, it's not really part of the talk, but it is a new center that has opened at the University of Michigan. Um, RISE is funded by Mellon, um, but also by Doris Duke Charitable Funds. And it's really been a collaboration, and this is now the academic hub of this collaboration. But I know, especially for grad students, a lot of times we sit around and we think about how does research get used and why is it important to do and, you know, is it is it going to be useful, right? So, uh, mm, I guess six, seven years ago, I started partnering with Illuminative. And Illuminative is a philanthropic organization um, that is entirely about changing the narratives um, and representations of contemporary Native people, pushing back, reclaiming the truth. So you think about what you see in textbooks and, and all of this. And, you know, really from the beginning, um, my role and my team's role has been to do the research. And it's really been so exciting because on top of it, Illuminative and Rise have a social action board. So we work with people from Hollywood. We work with people in education um, across the country. We work with people in legal domains um, around different issues. And you'll see some of the research today. But for me um, to be at this stage in my career and really feel like I'm, I get up every day excited about the work we're doing. I have the best team I've ever had. I'm having more fun doing research than I've ever had. Um, and on top of it, we built a lab and a community that reflects my values as an indigenous person that was about claiming space in academia for us to be a community, to be interdependent, to, to really think about that hierarchy and the importance of hierarchy for helping younger students to grow. And so it is very much my hope that we will also change social and cultural psychology. Um, so if you, if you look within our field, pretty much it's been Denise Sikakwaptua and I, um, and then there's this long period of no new native scholars. 
And now we have a first year and assistant professor who's at UW. And um, I take that as a compliment that I was replaced. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, but it shouldn't be that way. I mean, it's been so long. And so we currently have three indigenous PhD students um, working with us. Um, one's a fourth year, one's a second year. Um, one is with us and um, social work. They have that joint um, degree at Michigan. Um, and we've admitted two more. And so I feel like we really have the opportunity, both through the community we've built um, and through the work we're doing. I think our students find it very motivational, um, but they get to be in a team and have this hierarchy where there's always someone be, you know, in front of you who you can learn from, but you also have to learn because you will one day be that person in front. And so you know, we've really instilled this value. We've made it a part of who we are and it's, it's been so fun. So um, I think I understand when people talk about like your golden years, like if this is it, I can live with it. So, okay. So I'm going to talk today about omission as the modern form of bias against indigenous people. And what I want to tell you going into this talk is that it's a fairly new talk, but it's actually a talk I've dreamt about for decades. And so we finally have data um, I very much would love feedback. Um, I, I really welcome questions, thoughts. Um, you know, for me, it's like the concept of it. You're going to hear about 19 studies today, but they're kind of, many of them replicate. So I'll just show you one of the studies and then talk about the model, but they're all connected and we're trying to make a larger argument about omission. And so we often, when we think about stereotyping and prejudice, we think about like a stereotype is something you can see or you can envision, right? It's some characterization. But here we're talking about what you can't see, right? When, when a group is, is erased, intentionally left out. And, you know, for a long time, this has been a big part of the Indigenous story. Um, and it has deep roots in Canada, in the U.S. I will center mine as U.S., um, although pretty much you know, working in this area for as long as I have, the issues are not that different in Canada. And so, um, you know, I've never, you know, given a talk and had people say that just doesn't seem to resonate for me. So maybe you'll feel different, we'll see. So I wanna to start today with a quote by Jerome Bruner. Bruner, Bruner um, he says, if we can learn how culture makes minds, perhaps we can make cultures which make better or at least more fulfilled minds. So he says, if we can learn, right, if we can learn to do this, if we can learn to make cultures, we can leverage cultural change to improve psychological outcomes. And so this is especially important for indigenous people and how we think about the role of settler colonialism. So for the most part, people think of settler colonialism as something that happened a long time ago. But many of us would argue that it's something that's ongoing, right? Settler colonialism in the US and Canada is characterized by the erasure and dehumanization of indigenous people. So the erasure has been intentional. You put them on reserves, on reservations, right? You, you, you give us no power, um, no control over our communities. Um, literally you set up these, these spaces in which our lives feel hopeless, and so just, just to put it in perspective, we didn't actually become full, regular, normal citizens of the United States until 1974, in my lifetime. Before that, we were considered wards of the state. And the thought was that we weren't capable to make enough to make decisions for our own people. But really, it was all about land. I mean, there just have been numerous texts written about the importance of the Indian problem in the US is about land. They moved us, then found resources there. They wanna move us again. Um, you know, They create a treaty, then the treaty is broken. And yet when you look at the historical texts that kids read in school, these stories are rarely told in that way. And so now you're also erasing the psychological experience that, that our people are having. And so I often think about this through the lens of my children. 
And so when we're on the reservation and we drive down the road, my kids see people struggling with drug addiction, people who are homeless. These people look like them. And I think to myself, if they only know the story they learn in school, then they're left to wonder what's the matter with our people. But if you know the true story, if you know what colonization was all about and how it's ongoing, then you tell my children that when they see those people, but then they see the home they live in and the privilege they have as indigenous children, they can think, wow, look at how far we have come. And from that standpoint, right, we still have a ways to go. But then they can see themselves, I hope, as someone who can help to make that future different. And so a big part of this story about colonization and about omission, right, the erasure of indigenous people, um, it's evident in so many domains of society. And so I'm just going to show you a few examples. So in the media, less than a half of a percent of media representations portray contemporary indigenous people. Less than 5% of the first 100 images on Google and Bing portray contemporary indigenous people. Um, really, I mean, it's very, it's so interesting. We've been working with Amazon, with Google to try to think about what does it mean to change these algorithms um, so that something different comes up because Curtis, um, this is Edward Curtis's work. And, you know, I mean, People look at it all the time. He's a very famous photographer and it just automatically bounces up. What people don't know is actually Edward Curtis went to tribal communities and asked native people to dress the way he envisioned them. So in his work, there are plains people dressed like Southwest natives and there are you know, coastal natives dressed like plains natives. I mean, it, it truly, it's problematic in so many meaningful ways. 49% um, of people in our, so the very first study we did with um, Illuminative was reclaiming native truths. And this is where we're studying non-native uh, perspectives. So 49% of people reported rarely or never engaging with information about contemporary indigenous people. Across two samples, more than 80% of people reported not being able to name a famous living Native American. If we look at school curriculum, in the US, 87% of references to Native Americans in 50 public right, states academic standards portray Natives in a pre-1900 context. So think about, one, we're rarely represented, but then when we are, we're represented in a pre-1900 context. So again, we're talking about evidence that the entire country is being taught this story. And we cease to exist for the most part after 1900. Across two samples, when asked information about contemporary Native Americans, study participants responded, I don't know, more than 50% of the time. It's also the case, like we created like, we, I mean, we've tried it a couple of different ways. We created like a small survey of historical knowledge that's common um, and then of contemporary knowledge. And it was the case that in the US, people could have flipped a coin and done better than they did actually selecting answers. Um, when we did the, you know, where we had like multiple choice, it was abysmal. It was like less than 25% correct. And, you know, it, it's actually a painful reality to, to realize like most of the time people picked like what followed the stereotype. Um, and so, you know, it seemed like the best answer but you see how powerful that representation is. Okay, let's look at ourselves. So only a half a percent of the 40,000 peer reviewed papers on prejudice, stereotyping and intergroup relations mention Native Americans. So not even study participants, just mention them. Um, right, so, so when, when we think about this, like this is something that you know, I think a lot, like what is our responsibility as psychologists to make a change? Like, it's not hard to make natives a target of stereotyping and prejudice. You don't have to necessarily study native people, 
but we don't. And that's also driven by a larger narrative. And that narrative is that racism is a black issue. And so that black white binary has had a huge impact both in the country, both countries really, um, but also in our science. And so, um, you know, what we find <clears throat> is that people minimize Native people's experiences of racism and discrimination. So one piece of that is there was a Harvard um, Chan Public School um, did a survey and, and they found that 75% of natives report experiencing discrimination, but only 34% of Americans believe that natives experience discrimination. The difference for blacks, it's, it's within 10 percentile. Okay, so why does this matter? So social or public representation shape how people think, feel, and subsequently act towards indigenous peoples. Native people are often omitted from key conversations across various consequential societal domains. So you think about what do we do to address poverty? What do we do to, to address school inequalities, right? If there's no data, that's often used as a reason not to address the problem. And so then we think we still need to find data. And so we're still stuck in that space. And it has a greater effect as well on omission influences what indigenous children see as possible for themselves and what others see as possible for them. And so we're in this literal mutually constitutive world where in every domain that native children engage, people can't either see them as native, can't imagine what being native is like, minimizes their experiences, or just simply thinks that their experience is something that it's not. And so it's one of the reasons, I mean, I've been obsessed with invisibility and omission pretty much uh, through graduate school. So, I mean, it's not a new idea, but I think the way that the ideas have evolved over time have been interesting because I do see the ways in which I think early on, I was interested in what was happening in, in indigenous people's minds, like when you experience that moment of invisibility, but now I'm more <clears throat> interested in omission as something that is a feature of culture, right? It's something that happens out there. It's a function of how a group is or is not represented. So the roadmap for today, um, so there are three key pieces. I'm gonna talk about how omission perpetuates bias and discrimination, um, how that omission undermines indigenous people's psychological well-being, And then I'm gonna talk about how indigenous people are pushing back against omission. Okay, so when contemporary representations of indigenous people are omitted from the public consciousness, non-indigenous people report less warmth towards indigenous people, greater dehumanization of indigenous people, greater opposition to policies aimed at indigenous equity, right? Things like protecting sovereignty rights, rectifying resource inequality. So we also know that omission shapes how indig indigenous people, how non-indigenous people think about indigenous people. So these are just some correlations. I'm gonna go on to do more with them later. Um, so one of the ways in which we look at omission is the extent to which people believe that, that indigenous people are people of the past, right? And so the group and their experiences are solely historical or lack contemporary significance. Now, just to put it in um, a literary context, indigenous scholars have been writing about the frozen in the past phenomenon for decades. So we're not making a contribution in that sense. The contribution we're making is actually showing that it matters. So we've known forever that this frozen in the past representation existed. Um, and in fact, you know, we also know that it is tied to racism minimization. So there are a number of different ways in which we look at measures of omission. Um, but what's fascinating is this idea that how people think about people of the past also impacts the, the perception that contemporary people could experience racism. Not that surprising, really. I mean, it makes sense. If you think you're not here, 
then so too can you not hear being, ex you know, experiencing racism. So these beliefs stemming from omission shape support for broad policies and specific important issues affecting Native people. And so one way that we've been looking at this um, and one case that I wanna make is that I wanna look across three different domains. And so to think about like, what is the role in shaping broad policy support? So we had the opportunity. So if you get on project implicit now, the test is different than it was in the past. And Project Implicit had received a lot of complaint from Native people because the old IAT for Native people actually showed historical Natives. And so they were effectively replicating and reifying the idea that Native people only existed historically. So we have recreated the IAT. And with that, we had the opportunity to collect some data. Um, and in fact, we get to keep keep collecting data for a year. So that will be really fun. Um, but we, this, okay. So we had the opportunity to explore the perception that natives versus whites are people of the past versus contemporary across three samples. And so what we find is consistently, it's really high. And if we actually look at the percent of people, about 85% of people who take the test um, fall on the side of seeing indigenous people as being people of the past. So we then looked at how that fit into the model, right? So it turns out that these implicit people of the past perceptions are, are driving race minimization and the race minimization drives opposition to policies aimed at indigenous equity. And so I know a common issue um, that people ask is always like direction. And it turns out that across the different studies, so you're gonna see this combination of omission and race minimization, omission uh, perceptions of discrimination. And so I'm just gonna say, it always works in this direction. It sometimes works if you reverse the two. So, you know, I think we've been making this argument that omission drives race minimization. It drives perceptions of discrimination in large part because in theory, it makes more sense. Um, you know, empirically, they're also, it's correlational. And so we're trying to come up with other experiments to really tease that apart, this piece apart. Um, but I just want you to know, like, it's not, you know, we don't have the conclusive but over across all of the studies, if we consider it in that respect, this direction always works. It sometimes works in other cases. So now I can't remember if I went over this. I did. Okay. Sorry. First time in person. We're getting it, we're getting it back. Okay. So let's now look at another domain. So perceptions of red face versus black face. So we're taking from broad policies into these, you know, representational spaces. So here, a recent Pew Research Center study showed that a slight majority of Americans believe that dressing up as another race is generally unacceptable. More believe that blackface is unacceptable. It is not one that Pew does not ask the question about red face. But what we know is that Americans do it every weekend at sporting events. It happens across the country frequently. Um, and it has been interesting to see, like in the mascot debate, Edmonton um, changed their mascot. Like there, it, it extended by far into Canada. And it's nice to see that, that there's been some similarities there. So first, across five studies, so this paper is published in SPPS and it um, was driven by my grad student, Julissa Lopez. And across the five studies, we consistently find that people perceive red face to be more acceptable than black face. And we really, the study was not about that. It wasn't about trying to like show like, is one more harmful than the other? What we wanted to understand is the differential acceptability. Could we determine what predicts this differential acceptability? And so following the theory, 
right? It turns out, and in this case, we find in, across the studies where we have the pathways here, consistently we find it to work better in this direction. And so here we find that natives are more likely to be seen as people of the past, um, and people of the past drives racism minimization more so for natives, and race minimization drives, and, and these two factors help to explain the acceptability of racialized representations. And so it's also those straight across, as you saw, um, it also works. So we find that this differential acceptability ex is explained by these differences, right? We find that it has an impact on something that for, for indigenous people, we're often saying like, how is this not obvious? Like, how is the mascot issue not obvious? I mean, you know, for the most part, we're being put up there on the same level as dogs, lions, tigers, no disrespect to the animals, but you know, um, uh, you know there, there's some piece to this where it just seems so obvious, but what's fascinating is even among native people, there's a struggle. And a lot of that struggle is driven and our own work has shown by invisibility. So you will, I've heard elders in my community who have said, oh, you're just trying to make us invi more invisible. So we're talking about people not having good choices. And in this case though, you see the ways in which we can justify the omission and people do it consistently. But we also find that it impacts people's perceptions of murder, missing indigenous women and girls. So here um, I wanna share with you a couple of key points, um, the murder rate of Native American women is almost three times that of non-Hispanic white women. In one year, 5,721 Native American women went missing. Only 116 of the cases were recorded in the Department of Justice Missing Persons Database, and 5% were covered by national media. So of the perpetrators caught, 83% were male and over half were non-native. And in fact, one of the things that we know to be an interesting phenomenon is that natives are the one group for whom the in-group is not the majority perpetrator. So you see in violence against indigenous people, it's more often non-natives. And a lot of that is driven by, at least in the US, the relationship between the federal government and the rights of tribes to protect their people. And so living in a tribal community, because of that relationship and really how ineffective it is, native people do not have the same protections as other groups in America. And not only do we not have the same protections, it's actually the case that when someone is caught, 90% of the time they are not convicted or even tried for victimizing an indigenous person because we have to rely on the US government, the federal government to do this, um, to try them. And so they often come back and say, we don't have the resources. Um, you know, there was a horrible case um, in our community um, over the last year where a man had like basically turned a 13 year old native girl into a drug addict, sexually abused her. And the, she, he got time spent in jail, like, so oh, time served for it. So he got 18 months for doing this to a 13 year old indigenous girl. And so it's really hard. Like I have a daughter and I think about the fact that, you know, it's like, I feel like I can't let her out of my sight because it isn't simply that I can't protect her everywhere she goes, but it's also that I can't count on the government to protect her either. And we don't have the right to um, to prosecute non-natives. And so, you know, they're, they're just, the, the level at which this is problematic is, is terrifying. Um, but MMIWG extends into Canada entirely. Like it's one of those epidemics that crosses borders. Um, we actually collaborate a lot on this issue. So the question, we were interested in are what are the psychological factors contributing to the limited support and resources for MMIWG? And so this is a project that's being led by Jamie Yellowtail and Julissa. Um, and here we have now replicated this um, model. 
And so what you see is that, first of all, like the people of the past is once again, driving race minimization. And we could take that all the way out to support, right? So we can, we can follow that through. But we also see that race minimization drives perceptions of victim blaming and societal blame. And so we've got another project where we're looking at violent, like how people explain the violence against white women and violence against native women. And the big difference is that people blame native communities for the violence that native women experience, even though 80% of the violence is not at the hands of natives. And so then when we tell them, so that's like stat number two they get, people literally throw up their hands like, I don't know then, I, I don't know how to explain this, but generally people say, I don't know, rather than trying to like look the other direction. And so here we're seeing like these indirect effects here. Again, they explain apathy towards MMIWG and they explain policy support. And so the apathy piece we've really been trying to unpack because I mean, generally you're seeing like increased apathy um, and we've, we've looked at apathy, it's actually not it's an apathy measure, but I actually don't think it's getting at apathy. So when we, so I think it's actually more of a sense that people are shocked by how big the problem is. And so when, when we like break it down by different conditions, really what people are saying is like, I had no idea it was this big and knowing it's this big of a problem makes me feel like I can't do anything about it. And so um, you know, I think it's it's an important, like we're trying to tease that apart because it's an important piece that we want to be able to intervene on, um, but it will definitely take more work. Okay, so across these domains, what I've tried to show you is that indigenous omission reinforces people of the past perceptions, both explicitly and implicitly, and drives racism minimization. So now knowing that this is happening in the world, knowing that these are the ideas that are out there and that people have them, how does omission impact um, indigenous people? So I wanna start here with a quote by a 15 year old. I do have her permission to leave, to put her name, um, but Migas was asked in class, in her English class, to write six words that described her. And her six words were two words, same meaning, indigenous, invisible. And there's something really powerful about this, in part because she's so young, right? And she's very um, susceptible. So we would think of her as being very sensitive to omission. Well, part of this is recognizing that this, she's capturing it beautifully, but that it, she's not the only person who holds that. So we found that 87% of indigenous people feel that the average American does not care about their experiences. 77% feel that the average American thinks there are no real Native Americans left. And so this is our first ever Indigenous Futures Survey. We had 6,400 Natives who participated. Um, these numbers are generally not seen in psychology or really in any of the social sciences. Um, so it's been really exciting to, to be out there and think about um, you know, how we can give voice to people's experiences. So as documented in part one, omissions perpetuate discrimination. Okay, so we have that. So perceptions of discrimination in the literature are linked to poor psychological well-being. It's particularly true for natives. Like that data, this is very much the, the case um, for natives. So the research question, do omissions and misrepresentations impact indigenous people's well-being through perceptions of discrimination? So you can see the same variables but what we're doing is really looking at it from the indigenous person's experience. So we call them sensitivity to omission. And in part, you know, the sensitivity is hard. Um, and I'm just gonna, I'm kind of sharing all of the ins and out because right, oftentimes people are like, oh, you're just too sensitive. And we didn't want it to fall into that way of thinking that people, but it's really like, do I notice that my group is, not represented. And, you know, and then do I notice, do I recognize that, you know, my group is misrepresented? And so this is a say we actually have um, 
15,000 natives across three studies um, for this paper. And we do have the full manuscript. We have not sent it out yet. Um, we can't get past the first paragraph. We don't quite have the example we like, um, but everything else is written. And so what's interesting here is when we look at sensitivity to misrepresentation and omission, we get like these indirect effects, they're significant, right? They're, I mean, you can go directly from them to psychological well-being. We look at all of these measures of psychological well-being, psychological distress, life satisfaction, anxiety, depression, suicide ideation. Here are the data that you're seeing is for suicide ideation. But really, we see this very consistent pattern. So these representations are related to the extent to which indigenous people perceive discrimination, that their group is discriminated against, and the perceptions of discrimination also influence psychological well-being. And so we were very, um, I mean, it's, it's such a nice finding, um, but it, it's one that really like takes, again, building on cultural psychology, this mutual constitution piece. So it's both that we know the group is being omitted, we know that others perceive that omission, and when they perceive it, it influences the extent to which they think that indigenous people are discriminated against. Similarly, it has the same effect for indigenous people, right? That omission is driving their perceptions of discrimination and that is then impacting psychological well-being. Okay, so omission shapes perceptions of discrimination, which in turn undermines well-being. So I think that's not such a happy story, but I think, you know, in, in the end, there's another story, and that is that Native people are not just taking it, right? It's, there's absolutely evidence that Native people are fighting back. And so I want to end on that note. So Indigenous people are pushing back. So here's, um, this paper is um, the next set of studies. There's three studies are under, I guess they're now revise and resubmit. Um, and we, um, I'm gonna show you what I think is the more fun way that we looked at it, but we also did just like standards, um, you know, the survey approach. But here, okay, on election night in the US, CNN, um, when reporting on voter demographics, used a graphic that identified white, Latino, black, and Asian voters, but lumped native voters into a something else category. Literally within minutes, this something else around native Facebook, native Twitter is blowing up. I mean, it was hilarious, it, it really was. But like, even I was sitting, really something else? Like, I mean, I feel like they could have made a better choice of words, like even others feel somewhat better than something else. Um, but, what, what I think was particularly hurtful for Native people in this particular case is that because of the work that Illuminative, so we'd also taken a partnering with Native Organizers Alliance, which is a national organization that works with tribal communities across the country to, to build social movements. And so Native Organizers Alliance had been working to get out the vote, had been working to build these coalitions in tribal communities, and as a result, a record number of natives voted, a record number of natives were elected to Congress, six, and those record numbers were in Arizona, Wisconsin, Georgia, states that impacted the outcome of the election. And, and in fact, Native Organizers Alliance got a shout out by Van Jones on election night because of their work in these states. And they had gone out and really used the work from the Indigenous Futures Survey to motivate people to get out and vote. So it felt particularly hurtful, right? Um, and so what was interesting is that the incident of omission, right, it sparked outrage. So one collection of mocking memes um, shared on Facebook over 20,000 times in the 12 hours following the release of the graphic. Well, ain't that something else? I'm Native American, you're something else. Um, I mean, we saw like little native kids in t-shirts that said, so it used to be like in, uh, strong 
resilient indigenous. And it was like strong, resilient, something else. Um, I mean, it just like went, it, it went viral so fast. Uh, we also saw influential Native organizations, such as the Native American Journalist Association, Native Organizers Alliance, and Illuminative, spoke up online and in print media, criticizing the something else label. And so here, um, Rebecca Nagel said, last night CNN called Native voters something else, an election largely driven by race, the media still fails to accurately cover voters of color. For Native Americans, we're not even named. Being Native American is a political classification, not merely a racial background. To refer to indigenous voters as something else fails to recognize the sovereignty and political classification of Native voters. Um, and then the something else nations of Arizona folks, perhaps it's time to finally take note, A, DNC and mainstream news networks looking at you. The lack of focus and support for long-term political organizing within Native communities is ridiculous. Um, so, you know, what we're seeing like this outrage. So we sent out a survey the next day. Um, and because we've built this partnership across the country, we have more than 60 tribes who are part of our partnership, um, urban centers, um, different organ like native journalists, um, climate justice, like just the different organizations across the country. Within a few days, we got 3,500 responses. And so this is really based on that data. So we found in this study, and it's consistent with others, is that native identification drives recognition of native omission, which then drives perceived group discrimination. And you can kind of see the different pathways, um, but it helps to explain this connection between native identification and civic engagement. And you know, you're really seeing like using kind of this clever, like something else, that in fact, the extent to which people were offended by something else is playing right into the same old, like, yes, we perceive discrimination, um, but in this case, it actually drives civic engagement. And so we find like we, across the three studies, we look at civic engagement in different ways where we're asking about past engagement. Um, we, you know, it, however we look at it, it's, it's super interesting, um, but, once again, we're seeing like we can also tap into these factors to get Native people to get out there and vote. And so highly identified Indigenous people engaged in more civic activities. Being omitted in society may be a critical component of Indigenous people's understanding of the discrimination that their group faces. And so I just want to return to Bruner. Um, so in order, I would argue, that in order to make a more just future for indigenous people, that is, right, a future that with what more with better and more fulfilled minds, we must begin by revealing the processes that keep us from moving forward. And we must work to be seen for who we really are and to be acknowledged for the contributions Native people are making both within our own communities and in society at large. So I want to conclude that the modern form of bias against Indigenous people is the omission of contemporary representations of the ways in which Indigenous people contribute to society. And so I just want to bring this back to settler colonialism, right? Really, we're empirically testing settler colonialism. Um, but we're also, you know, we hope contributing to our understanding of what constitutes discrimination and you know, how we should think about traditional forms of discrimination. Social change requires infusing the broader cultural context with more accurate contemporary representations that are defined by indigenous people. So this partnership that we've created with NOA and Illuminative has a whole nother piece. And that is the third arm of the RISE Center is about working with artists um, and social activists to, to continue to create movements and to, and to galvanize support for change across Indian country. And so we see this, um, one of the artists we work with is Matika Wilbur. She has the Project 562. And in contrast to Edward Curtis, the purpose of her project has been to go to every tribal community across the country and to photograph contemporary Native people the way that they want to be seen today. And she actually has a book that's going to come out this year. Um, I, got to, I got to peruse it recently, and 
you know, I love her. I love her photography, um, but I also love the ways in which she thinks about, like she, she takes the story of every person and, you know, really thinks about how to portray them as contemporary people who are out there doing things in the world. And so she's kind of playing with what do you call this book, right? So she's playing with like Native Now, um, but, you know, her, the images are absolutely phenomenal and I love them. Um, it really gives you a sense of both how Indigenous people continue to be connected to culture and community, but also the ways in which we're absolutely out there doing things in the world. Um, indigenous people and communities have already begun leveraging this change. Um, so we're seeing real changes in Hollywood. Um, so there've been a couple of shows that came out this past year, um, Reservation Dogs and Rutherford Falls. Um, and actually both of the directors and writers are on our board. And so we've had like these opportunities, like if you watch them, you will hear them talk about invisibility. And so Sierra, who's the senior writer, um, we were at a, um, a 50th birthday party together. And, you know, at one point I got to sit down with her and I was like, you know, that like episode where you guys, and she was like, oh yeah, I got that from your guys' piece. And I mean, just to actually see someone create public representation where they're engaging your research is so exciting, right? Because I was like, wow, I feel like we could have read that. And then to hear that, in fact, like we could have wrote it and we kind of did. And so, but we're seeing it across the different um, films, documentaries that are coming out. We are definitely seeing more attention in Hollywood. And, and it's not for lack of like, it's not circumstance, it's not chance. In fact, um, Crystal Echohawk, who leads Illuminative, does workshops with NBC, ABC, and she's really putting this research to work. Um, you know, we've seen huge changes in politics. Interestingly, there's a gender dynamic where we're seeing more Native women um, emerging as leaders, both within tribes. So we actually made that part of Indigenous Future Survey too. Um, so we're collecting that data now um, and really want to think about sort of the changing gender um, effects and why, like, why do people think it's happening? Because I think we see somewhat across the country that more women are rising to leadership, but the shift in Indian country has been swift. Like there was, I don't know, maybe like 10, 15 years ago, it was always about getting one woman on tribal council in our community. And now the majority of tribal council is female. And so, but that's just been true in many places. We've also seen um, tribes leveraging change in a variety of ways. So 93% of federally and state recognized tribes have tribal justice systems. They're all, they all have their own laws. They're all independent. We don't, like the laws in my community are not the laws in Puyallup or Nooksack, any of it. Like every tribe has their own judicial system. Similarly, the Indian Child Welfare Act, right? So tribes develop systems. So there've been a number of, um, there's some really high profile and wealthy individuals who have been trying to take down the Indian Child Welfare Act. And it's so interesting because really, like we can do things that the state cannot do for our children. And so, but they cherry pick stories of like children who died in tribal foster care systems, ignoring the fact that children die in state foster care systems all the time, right? And, but are using it, but that the importance, like that fight for ICWA has been about us having control over our own children's futures. And so Violence Against Women Act, tribes have been fighting to protect women and children, to charge non-natives for committing violence against native women and children. And you know, the push, like there is like a um, temporary, so four or five tribes have the right and basically have to prove to the US government that we can be fair to non-natives which is really ironic because at no time have they ever shown they can be fair to us. Um, but there's also no evidence that we are not fair. And so tribes across the country are building schools, language revitalization programs, right? So there's absolutely no evidence that we're going away despite the overwhelming belief that we no longer exist.
And so I would end by saying that the onus for changing these representations does not rest solely on Indigenous people. It's absolutely essential that other people, and I would argue researchers, professors, like do your part to bring these issues to light and to give them the voice that they deserve um, so that we can change the future and create right, better and more fulfilled minds. And I think that's true for both sides. So thank you. So I'm just gonna say, in terms of questions, you can ask anything. I, I am not uh, sensitive about, like, I just think people have more or less exposure to these issues. So please feel free to ask whatever. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, the, and it just made me think about the, you know, the very prominent and horrific examples of the grave sites, uh, mm -hmm. grave yep. sites uh, uh, happening in Canada and the US, yeah. Um, and how that is to this idea of people that the past, right? Old uh, <coughs> graves are the epitome of right. the past. Right. Um, and, you know, yeah, so like, does that almost. Um, Absolutely. Almost more right. 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 Yeah. 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 In fact, my grandparents were in boarding schools, so it really isn't that long ago. Um, I mean, you're hitting it right on the head. And in fact, um, I happen to know that on April first, it will be released. Um, so you know, Deb Holland made um, a. Oh, I don't know what she calls it, but like a official executive decision to have the boarding schools in the US, like to go back to the archives and really pull out the real history. And so a friend of mine um, that I grew up with is actually head of that program. And she said that when the data comes out in April, it's, it's really gonna shock people. And you know, when that article came out from Canada, an interest, I mean, it was really interesting because I think it created a lot of um, violent, like, reminders of violence for us. So there was a lot of secondary vicarious trauma. And it was interesting because our tribal our tribal chairwoman um, put out a letter um, to the community about the boarding school that was in our community and the children. I mean, and she said, we all knew that it happened. We all know that we lost children. We just never could do or say anything about it. And she said, you know, basically she wanted to remind us to be kind to one another and to remember that, like, if you are feeling that hurt, it's a deep seated hurt that goes back generations. And so it was a really, I was like, go Terry. Wow, you killed it. Okay. Um, but I think you're right on. Like, it's both, I think, for us and for others. Um, I mean, I, the number of talks I'm giving in Canada this year um, has been really interesting. And and I think it's in part because there is sort of this recognition that we're not paying enough attention. Um, and so, I mean, I'm kind of grateful for that report coming out. And, you know, people are like, oh, Canada. And I was like, slow your roll. <laughs> it was way worse here. Um, I don't know if that's true, but, you know, I just wanted people not to like do the distancing piece um, because I think that's exactly what the U.S. does um, consistently. Yeah. I, I also I mean, thank you for the talk and commentary. And I also was really interested in this idea of the soul of the past that we thought about it in that way. Um, what I do think about more is thinking of the distribution of the problem of the past. I think that's mm -hmm. like a common mm -hmm. perception. And mm -hmm. more common than I'm sure. I guess I just get to be any thoughts about that. I mean, you think about you know, yeah no that's interesting so you know there's a canadian researcher amy bombay who shows that these like the boarding schools for example she looks at boarding school survivors like and then their children and the next generation and then compares them to 
same generation who weren't taken to the boarding school and finds like still heightened cortisol levels, like heightened stress, greater, um, you know, life dissatisfaction. So there, there's, some, you know, I mean, she's making the argument that something is getting passed down. And, and of course, that intergenerational trauma is very real. But it is really interesting to think about sort of this perception, right? Because I think even among people, I think myself included, like I never wanted to be seen as a victim. So like, I've always wanted to sort of create some distance, like this is happening to my people, but not to me, right? And it's like, some of that is a need, I think to, to feel like you're going through the world, not feeling like you're always being victimized, right? Yet my obsession with these issues actually stem from graduate school. And, you know, participating in talks at a center that was about, you know, race and ethnicity and having these scholars come in and talk about the history of race in America and not talk about native people and the deep sense of like existential angst it created for me and yet not being able to say it, not being able to figure out how to make people understand like the data on the impact of like omission on psychological well-being. I mean, if it hadn't been true, I'd have been blown away. Because I mean, there's just something very deep and real about it. And I think for me growing up in my tribal community, growing up in the reservation, growing up with grandparents who did this, but also being very academic, right? Being a good student. I just feel like consistently it's been my story. And so, you know, these like how we think about people of the past, um, I mean, you see the same kind of violence psychologically towards blacks. So in textbooks, they most often show uh, the civil rights in black and white photos, even though it wasn't, I mean, there was color then, um, but you know, I mean, it's, it's the same effect. And so there's a interesting theory, um, Shanina Loma Waima and uh, Teresa McCarty wrote a theory about basically like identity safety, but really talking about how education is set up to create identity safe zones for majority children. And that when we understand that that's the ultimate goal, then you start to realize like we can, we can, you know, the 1619 project, the work we're doing at RISE, like people will always push back because it's not about us. It's about protecting um, the American identity. And so we have a whole nother line looking at the impact of national identity on people's attitudes towards like Columbus Day versus Indigenous Peoples Day, like really trying to tease apart like, okay, so if this is all about the American identity, how can we show that you can actually make change and still protect this American identity, right? But then there's sort of the question like, what does it mean to stand behind an identity that is so problematic? Like, is it leading to well being? Does it really have these positive outcomes? Because it's gotten us right where we are today. I mean, pretty much like this crazy state we're in right now is all about protecting whiteness, protecting the American identity, protecting people's like ideas of what makes America great. Um, and, and those ideas are really problematic because to hold them, you have to ignore all the, the historical wrongdoings that America has committed. And so that commitment to not owning the truth has been an essential key feature, right? And I think it's one way in which I think Canada through the 90s was trying to differentiate itself. Although, I mean, no offense, but Canada's kind of fallen back into these, these other ways, right? But Canada like made a formal apology to the indigenous people. And, you know, I think there was a time, like I remember when that happened and thinking, wow, like they owned it. Wow, like the US could ever, the US would never do it. I mean, the closest we came was Barack Obama. Um, and it was like a, a step in that direction, but not a full, we're gonna own this. And so, but it's because it's tied to land and it's tied to money and it's tied to, you know, treaties and, and you know, the repercussions of which um, America doesn't wanna deal with. Yeah. Uh, I have two questions from chat. So I'm just going to do that and then we can come back to uh, stuff in here. So Amori asks, uh, thank you for highlighting the meaning and impact of invisibility. I'm curious to what extent you attribute it to long histories of policies that explicitly tried to erase indigenous culture, for example, residential schools versus modern people's discomfort with thinking they are racist, for example, mm -hmm. racism by omission 
is easy to ignore and pretend that it doesn't exist uh, and that you don't contribute to it? So I think that's a good question. I don't know that I can truly answer. I mean, I think we're trying to point out both. I do think like by highlighting the schools, highlighting, we're trying to pull out the ways in which we're systemically erasing Native people, but there's very much an erasure that happens, right? I mean, people make decisions not to talk about or not to include all the time. And so like we have a we have an NSF grant that's about like how people justify the different forms of omission to try to tease some of that out. But I do think it's important for individuals to own it. Like even if you've been taught not to think about indigenous people, if you are the kind of person who believes you should do better, then you have to be intentional about changing it. And so, you know, I think it's important for individuals to own it, but I do think it's very systemically um, driven and it's so deeply embedded into our systems that, you know, I think we're really right now trying to, to point out those systems um, by looking at, you know, many different ways. Um, oh, is, that, is that helping there? Uh, Amari, if you want to follow up, just po post it in chat. And I like to I'm very I keep looking. To... I don't know where to look. It's like... <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to be Amori's avatar right now. Okay. Um, while Amori is maybe thinking of any follow-ups, I'll just go ahead and do the other question from Chad right now. Oh, Amori says thank you. So, oh, okay. Um, excellent. You're welcome. Um, uh, Benjamin Ben Chung asks, uh, work on cultural continuity by, by our former colleague, yes. Michael Chandler, yes. found that indigenous communities with greater control over their own communities, yep. for example, education, emergency yes. services, predict lower suicide rates yep. with 90 percent plus of federal tribes in the u.s having their own judicial system has there been work looking into the before after yep. and the health of those communities in terms of mental physical and or social outcomes yeah so i'm very familiar with that work um and was very sad when i heard that michael passed um but uh i i one we've not been able to that people have tried to replicate that in the states and it actually plays out differently. So, so that, that's one issue that there seems to be a piece there. But I think this idea of continuity is super important and is very relevant. I just think there's something like more in how it's playing out in, in the US. Um, can you actually say the last part of that again, though? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, with 90% plus of federal tribes in the US having their own judicial systems, has there been work looking into the before after in the health of those communities yeah. in terms of mental, physical, or social outcomes? Yeah, okay. So what it led me to is that there's actually a new phenomenon emerging, and I actually think it's tied to gaming, um, where we're actually seeing that like having control is one thing, having money is another. Um, so tribes who have had more financial success are actually seeing more suicide and I think part of that is driven <clears throat> by the fact that it's creating swift cultural change, which then comes back to, to Chandler and the Lawn's paper, where I think people get that sense of like, it's both like self-continuity and cultural continuity. So there's both a historical and a future, right? So the, that paper is really making the argument that you both need to see your connection to who you are in the past, but you also have to be able to envision yourself in the future and that these kinds of colonial processes are creating disconnect. And so I think that money influx, fast cultural change are creating the same kind of disconnect. And it may be a variable like that that would actually help us figure out why that model's not holding in the US. So, I mean, I'd even be interested to like add in like per capita tribes versus not uh, like, so I don't know, are you guys familiar with per capita with the, okay. So in the US um, in gaming tribes, some tribes choose to use the money for social services. Some choose to treat tribal members like your stakeholders. And so, so then you get what's called like per capita. So you get like money each month or each year that's tied to being a stakeholder in this um, organization. And so, but I think the tribes where, you know, so like my tribe is a per capita and a social. So, so we make the choice to like put the majority of money back into the community and then, you know, individual tribal members get some money. Um, and then 
you know, but we've actually seen a lot of suicide in our community. And so <clears throat> we're the second wealthiest uh, gaming in on the West Coast. Um, Pechanga is the only one doing better and they're a much smaller community. So I think there's a lot of variables there. Um, it is something I, I would love to, to unpack, um, but also the, the gaming stereotype is very much imp impacting how um, legislators are seeing us, um, but also people have the stereotype that like we're all wealthy natives and only 30% of tribes actually make enough money that they break even from their gaming facilities. Um, and so, you know, for the most part, people just are completely missing the boat on that issue. But yes, I, I think it's a really great comment. I just think there's, there's, there's so many slices to that that I would love to unpack. Yeah. Uh, so what are the Yeah. Yeah. Currently, a lot of Yeah. 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 I don't know, given that we pretty much show it existing in almost every domain, it's hard to say, because I don't think, for example, in education, in school, I don't think it's that teachers are driving it. It's like happening at the level of the textbook makers, but also they won't change it, even though they know that it's not true. Um, and so it's it's being driven by something, I don't know what comes behind that, like, right? But it's definitely the case, like in the legal domain, a lot of it is money. Um, you know, we see the the battle over the state parks, over resources. Um, there, there continue to be a, a drive to try to take land, and then native communities trying to take land back. Um, so I, I don't, I don't know. I, I feel like it's a really. Um, it depends on like what region you're in. Um, you know, I mean, we're still seeing like in the southwest, for example, mining is still um, like. Navajo still doesn't have good water. And, you know, in large part um, because of uranium waste disposal. Um, and, you know, there was a spill that happened at the same time as Three Mile Island um, that was greater. And Three Mile Island was cleaned up in three to four months. Navajo continues at the rate at which they're cleaning it up. I mean, this happened in like the 60s, early 60s. I mean, they still don't have water. They still have high rates of um, cancer. Um, stillborns, and, and it's driven, I mean, water, it's all about water. And yet, you know, the um, water is life movement um, in North Dakota, you know, was very much driven by, like, if you don't protect our water, like our farms, um, everything. So, but it, it all comes back to big business on those, right? And the oil industry, mining, um, they have deep pockets and are very much protected. Um, so we were actually like the water is life, the standing rock situation was actually moving in a direction of being positive for standing rock Sioux. And then unfortunately, like it happened on the cusp of Obama going out and Trump coming in. And the minute Trump came in, he shut that down. And so it, it you know, I don't know. It's so hard to live in a world where who's in leadership has such a big impact on on our lives, right? So, um, other thoughts, questions? Yes. So, I'm actually really curious to get your thoughts on whether the terminology actually contributes to some of these ideas of like eraser and a little bit of people of the past. So, when we think about terms like Native Americans or Indigenous people, like versus actually talking about the communities, like for example, that we are on, like, must be on the territory. Right? Mm -hmm. That that actually plays a role in contributing to some of these like thoughts about like omission and well, you're kind of like lumping a lot of different people into like yeah. I mean, I you know it's interesting because the I mean the language has changed a lot over time. Um, hmm. I guess I'm not sure if it's. Okay, so is it the at the level of label or is it at the level of 
we just naturally have these associations with the term native or with the term indigenous. And, you know, I've always um, had this issue, like when I say I grew up on the reservation, it's like, I definitely feel like people envision some kind of primitive, um, you know, I'm, and, you know, I, I, have, I could go on with stories for days about the things that often follow people's thoughts about the reservation, um, about, oh, did you have to buy new clothes to come here? Oh, I didn't know people like you went to school. Oh, did, I mean, it's, it's endless, right? Um, and uh, so I don't know. I don't know, like, where it's at. Like, because, I mean, is there just something about the idea of indigeneity that is primitive and that leads people to that idea um, does like if you say Standing Rock Sioux or or Musqueam, like for the most part, then people don't know who they are. And so it's like it works in a local context. So certainly like when I'm around Tulalip, you know, in that community, people know Tulalip. And so like I wouldn't say indigenous there. I would say Tulalip, but like in Michigan, nobody knows Tulalip and they don't even know Coast Salish. I mean, most people in Michigan have no idea that there's tribes in Washington state. So, I mean, it just ends up being hard. So I, I don't know, it's an interesting idea, um, but I, I, I fear it's something we link to the idea of natives more generally that we think like native people are just like, you know, you sort of imagine the the representation in, I think like Peter Pan, it's like, I think that's where people's minds go. And so there's something about saying you're native that I'm like, I know this person is thinking I'm some primitive figure right now. Like there's just, there's something about that representation I don't know how to get away from, so. Yeah, um, yeah I guess like part of the reason I was also asking because I know that you well, and I, I would just say, like, I think what we've seen in the U.S. is movement towards indigenous. So we asked what Native people wanted to be called, like what terms and Native and indigenous were the highest. Um, and then American Indian has totally fallen out of favor. Only 25% liked American Indian and it was mostly elderly people. And then of course, everybody likes being called by their tribe. But they also also say they like people to say it correctly and that doesn't happen that often. So, you know, there's that issue. Yeah. I just wanted to tag onto that question because I wondered, like um, even last night when we were talking, but also came up in the talk, the distinction between uh, uh, being uh, sort of uh, characterized in terms of being a race or ethnicity, mm -hmm. or being characterized mm. as a political, political identity. identity. Yeah. And I wondered if in any of your research you have or have considered like manipulating that. Does that have an effect, for example, on like the research you talk about again in terms of galvanizing? Yeah. Yeah, we haven't. I mean, I, I think that would actually be easy to build in to the work that we're doing. Because, I mean, people who understand sovereignty understand why the political identity. Okay, so for people who don't know, um, so the big argument for in the States, I don't, I don't know what, I don't know about this in Canada, um, is that Native people are recognized as a political identity, not a race identity. Even though we experience racism, but the whole treaty piece is a political move. And then of course, like we're nations within a nation. And so there's this piece. And so during the Trump administration, a big part of Donald Trump's effort was trying to say that, you know, we need to stop this native people are just a race. And really what he was trying to do is if you make us a race, then you take away our political status and our political status is what protects our sovereignty. Um, and so, you know, generally we find like native people because we're not taught in school, don't have a good understanding of sovereignty. And so when they do, they understand the political argument. So I think we're going to see that people who like get the political argument piece are going to people be people who are more like involved um, in tribal government more, right? So they, they have that. Um, 
And then I think for the most part, people don't know what to do. And then there are like native people who, because we're a political identity, don't want to think about race, which also creates a problem because right then you don't know how to help other people see the experiences our people have. So it's, I mean, I, I, I'm gonna hold on to this. We might have to talk about it more. So it would be easy to add in actually. Um, and I mean, Literally, I could text and we could add it to the Indigenous Future Survey right now and get a thousand people and get an answer. I have one more question from Chad, and I think given the time, it's also going to be the last thing. So uh, this is from Lee Laufer. He asks, how do you bring forward uh, support settlers that can uh, that see the situation but don't know how to move themselves forward and away from the ancient uh, narrative, particularly people associated with churches? Wait, say the beginning again. How do you bring forward uh, or support settlers that see the situation but don't know how to move themselves forward and away from the ancient narrative, particularly people associated with churches? Hmm. That is a very loaded question. Um, and I think I would probably have a follow-up question um, and wonder if the, is it Leila or Will? Lee? Lee? Um, could you say a little bit more about where you're headed with the question? Because I think like the, the connection to churches is is very interesting, um, but I I think the settlers' commitment. Yeah. So, what is the end goal here? Like, is is the question really more about how do we move settlers towards an acceptance, or is it understanding why they don't accept? Would you what is there, my interpretation is how for settlers who do understand that this is a problem, how to move forward beyond the narrative. Yeah, so I mean, reminds me of a conversation I had yesterday about allies. Um, you know, I think it's really hard because I feel really jaded right now. Um, and I think a lot of that jadedness is I think that a lot of people who want to be allies want to be allies so long as it doesn't discomfort them or require change. And so I think where I really stand right now is that I don't know. Um, I've envisioned, like I wrote a perspectives for a book that I want to write, and then I don't know when I'm ever going to get to it because, you know, this life happens. But the, you know, a lot of it early on was the idea of helping people to see how you could be an ally to Indigenous people. Um, but more and more I'm jaded because I, I'm just not sure that people that I think are allies are actually allies for the reason I would hope that they were allies. I think it's more um, altruistic. And, and, you know, I think what we know about altruism is it's often self-driven um, and about feeling better about myself. And so um, I don't, I, and I don't want to offend anybody because I, it's not, I just am not seeing it. Like I'm not seeing um, people make those kinds of steps and actually working to make change. So what I see is people saying, yes, 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 that's, that's right. That's right. That's, um, but then nothing follows that. So yes, Stephanie, we're in agreement. <laughs> you go fix that. Um, so, you know, it's, I, I don't quite know what to do um, with it right now. I think it's, um, I, I don't like that I feel so pessimistic, but it's just really hard given everything going on um, in the US, in politics, I mean, even our town, um, it just doesn't feel like a good place um, right now. So I, I don't know the answer to that, yeah. Somebody should study that. I think in the interest of time, we should probably call it. So let's thank. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.